Hi, I'm Scott Hahn. I want to welcome you to The Road to Emmaus, a podcast from the St. Paul Center. Today, we are blessed to have Father Timothy Vaverick, but also to be filming live here at Ogle Bay Resort, where we have over 230 priests for our annual conference. And so, Father Timothy, it's great to have you here. And what I'm hoping we can do is talk about the brand new book that you have, As I Have Loved You, uh, Our Salvation in Christ. And before we get into the book, uh, tell us a little background about your own upbringing and where you are in the Austin Diocese. Austin Diocese. My, my family home is in San Marcos, which is um, uh, between Austin and San Antonio. And that's where my parents still are, and a number of my siblings live in the area. Um, that's where I <coughs> graduated high school. It's a college town. Took my degree in of, uh, all things physics, and then um, wound up, instead of going to graduate school in physics, wound up going to the seminary. Uh, did a year up at the University of Dallas, um, doing some leveling work in philosophy. And um, I pretty much figured to stay there and do the whole program there, but then the bishop sent me off to, to Rome. I was in Rome for four years with uh, education by the Jesuits at the Gregorian, and then in 85 came back and entered uh, priestly ministry for the mm. Diocese of Austin, which I've been largely in the Waco area for most of that, probably 30 of the 30, 32 years of the 37, I'll be a priest this year. So. Wow. Now, when you were in Rome studying at the Gregorian, what was the area of uh, interest or focus of your study? I did my, uh, so my uh, STB, the baccalaureate, which is general theology for three right. years. Then I started uh, narrowing in on um, dogmatics. For your licentiate. For my licentiate, mm -hmm. which I began with the, at, at the Greg and then um, got ordained. I had an unusual assignment of three years. I was on loan to the Diocese of St. Marin up in Brooklyn, so the Maronite Lebanese Catholics. Oh, yeah. And while there, I pursued um, uh, once a week, took classes down at the Dominican House of Studies and pursued my licentiate under um, now Archbishop Augustine de Noya. Mm -hmm. And that was on Newman um, and his personalist approach to understanding the church and a believer's assent in conscience to the church. So I like to say that I'm ecumenically educated, both Jesuit and Dominican. <laughs> yes. So later I completed my doctorate, um, didn't have to do, I took a sabbatical for a semester when I was pastor in Waco and um, then finished the dissertation there back home. And in 96, received my doctorate there from that was in ecumenical studies. I did an examination of the understanding of church and the pastoral office from a Southern Baptist and Roman Catholic point of view. Now, sounds like providential preparation for much of your ministry, that kind of ecumenical background. Our paths first crossed, I, I seem to recall, when I went down to Waco and you were pastoring at St. Joseph's, which became something of a convert mill where so many students at Baylor, the largest Baptist university in the world, not just undergraduates, graduate students, not just grad students, but also faculty, and not just a trickle, but a rather steady stream. Uh, one of the Protestant faculty members who I will not name spoke of you as being sort of, you know, sort of standing at the door and you know, he was uh, always kind of sending men and women your way. And so before I got there, I had heard about the grace of holy orders that had come to the Vaverick brothers. But then to see the fruit of your ministry there, how many years were you at St. Joseph's right across from Baylor? Yes, yeah, so I was 20 years as pastor at St. Joseph's. Of course, growing up <clears throat> as a Catholic in Texas, all my high school classmates, they were all Baptists. Of course. So I was like the token Catholic in the crowd. Good training. Uh, good, <laughs> absolutely good training. Um, um, those people are still my friends. Uh, it was a great time uh, toward the mid to the end of the 70s. Lots of craziness going on in the world, but a solid group of people, very well balanced, but committed to the Lord Jesus. And so, uh, like one of, my, one of my high school friends said at my first mass, 
well, we trained you right. You preached just like a Baptist. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, when I was down there, a number of faculty, Protestant and Catholic, identified you as the de facto chaplain at Baylor, precisely because of how much spiritual direction, not just for those who were converting, but even for those who didn't necessarily intend to become Catholic, you were there really as a, uh, a great guide. And so that actually leads us to the next point in our conversation, because you're not at St. Joseph's anymore, but you're close to Baylor. What is the parish where you are? Yes, I'm now the next parish north of uh, St. Joseph's, which was one of the mother parishes. St. Joseph's was founded in 1951. I'm at Assumption Parish in West, which was founded in the 1890s. Uh, largely, far and away, a Czech community, uh, but there are some, some Germans on the periphery. Yes. Um, okay. But it's a large parish. It's, um, I've always been, prior to this, always pastor of small parishes, maybe, maybe, maybe 200 families, maybe 400 families. Um, but this is 1,200 families plus a school uh, and a daycare. So it's a lot different uh, experience there. Well, I see a lot of spokes that converge upon the hub of this project that I want to talk about, and that is your forthcoming book, As I Have Loved You, Our Salvation in Christ. Because as you indicated, you have an ecumenical background, not only in your formation, but in your own upbringing in Texas. But you also have that evangelical impulse that comes from Baptist friends, I suspect, and your own preaching style. But there in your own heart, through Newman, whose emphasis on a personalist approach to doctrine and church history and the development of doctrine, all of these things, I suspect, have converged upon a book that's only six chapters long. But this book really captures the heart of the Catholic gospel and how much we share with non-Catholics, but how much we can take it up to the next level. So why don't you walk us through what it is you're doing in this book, As I Have Loved You, Our Salvation in Christ. I'm trying to <clears throat> recover, rediscover um, what our salvation in Christ is about. Um, for various reasons, <clears throat> since sometime in or after the Middle Ages, um, <clears throat> we drifted off in certain ways into a forensic or a juridical notion of salvation that runs something like, you know, well, why did Jesus die? He died to save us from our sins and to make satisfaction for our sins. Which isn't wrong. Which isn't wrong as it's such. It's just inadequate. It's inadequate. It becomes more inadequate later as our understanding of justice becomes reduced to legal structure. Right. which is not the original concept of justice. And so this makes it almost look like, stereotypically, can look like a quid pro quo, this for that. So we did something wrong, Jesus takes the punishment, and now we get to go to heaven. Um, when in fact, the, the gospel message is much more profound. Jesus uh, describes his going to the cross as um, that he must be lifted up so that he can draw everyone to himself. Uh, and the gospel message is that we have become one with God in Christ. And so now we share in his life and in his ministry. And so we are involved in the work of salvation, not only our own, but the salvation of the world, because we're sharing in the life and the mission of Jesus. And that sense of transformation by which we come to share Christ's life and are divinized, we would say in the West, um, that's become a rather unknown or obscure concept. Right. Or what the Orthodox, of course, would call theosis. Right. right? The, the, the deification, the divinization of the Christian person. So once that happens, if, if Jesus has died to forgive us our sins so that he heaven can be open, we don't go to hell, what does that really mean for my daily life? Right. Right. Um, because there's a certain extrinsic, external aspect of that, whereas, um, whereas what Christ has done is he has come and shared our life specifically, right? It's not just he became a man, I'm a man, therefore he came for me, right? Jesus knew me and loved me. And by that fact, he united himself to me in the midst of my uh, joys and sorrows and sins and, and the mess of my life. 
making my life his own and thereby making his life mine. Now, that's a very different understanding of the Christian life than I think a lot of people have. You know, in the very opening chapter of your book, you indicate the need to balance these two extremes. On the one hand, the autonomous individualism, you know, that I'm going to heaven, that I am saved, you know, it's me and Jesus, and it's hopefully you and Jesus. And that certainly is a major part of our own Protestant subculture as Americans. On the other hand, there is a tendency to, toward collectivism. That is, Jesus assumed human nature, and so humans are saved. And it's like, well, okay, but what about me personally? Not individualistically, but not just a part of a whole. What about me in terms of my relational framework, my relational ontology, the fact that I'm not born an individual, I'm not even born a male, I'm born a son, or someone's born a daughter, then they become a brother or a sister, then a husband or a wife. There, there is this covenantal framework, and you basically lay the foundation in the first chapter, you know, avoiding the, the polar opposites of individualism on the one hand and mere collectivism on the other, that axis then becomes the covenant, what you call the mystery of the covenant, around which the mystery of salvation turns in a much deeper and more holistic way. So we're not doing away with the legal, you know, any more than you're doing away with the skeleton that you see in the x-ray of your wife. But you're capturing something that is truly nuptial. That is the mystery of the covenant understood in terms of a marital bond of interpersonal communion. And when I'm reading this manuscript, I'm thinking, you know, this is exactly what we need for the new evangelization to be more than just, you know, a new committee with a new program, you know, with bureaucrats running it. But I mean, you've captured the heart of the Catholic gospel, especially by showing that it's not just about being forgiven and then avoiding hell and making it home to heaven, but really is our sharing in Christ's own divine sonship as the Son of God had become the Son of Man to make it possible for us to do the impossible, right. becoming children of God. Right. It's almost too good to be true, except you show this is the gospel truth according to Scripture and tradition, but also according to the Catholic Church's teaching. Right. Yes, well, one of the things that happened <clears throat> in the West anyway, is we lost an awareness of what a person is. And we reduced a person to an individual. Right. And an individual, the word itself, comes from undividable. And an individual is one of a collection of similar things, the least common denominator. So if you have a bunch of books on a shelf, one book is the individual. Got a bunch of guys in the platoon, one guy is an individual. Um, human beings aren't that way. We can't be understood as individual. That's reductionist. Right? Because we never were. That's right. We are relational. Um, and so there's always a reference to our relationship to God, to others, and the world. Collectivism is kind of a response to individualism, right? Right, and and there you just get an amalgam, right? right? One extreme engenders the opposite. Engenders the yeah. opposite. Whereas, as we know from, uh, I mean, the concept of person is very a very Christian concept. It wasn't used. The word wasn't used that way by the ancients. It was adapted, not just adopted. It was adapted uh, in the early church to talk about the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Three persons, one God. But not three individuals. But not three individuals. Yes. Or they'd have to be three gods. Right. Right? Um, and, of course, in theology, Trinitarian theology, the discussion is about the fact that the distinction of the persons is entirely a result of the relation, the distinct relation of the Father to the Son and of the Father and the Son to the Spirit. That is their identity, is in that relation. Well, this is the case also for the human person, it is in relation, first of all, to God, and then in, in and through God to others and the rest of creation. We lost sight of that. And so then it's hard to, once you become an individual, if you think that you're sustained individually, any relations are optional. They're add-ons. They're simply a function of will. 
that I choose to have this relation. They are not, they are not integral, constitutive who you are. And that's you, what's happened to, I mean, that's what happened, broadly speaking, that's what's happened in Western civilization, right? right? I mean, you have summarized literally five, six, or seven centuries of intellectual devolution where things have devolved into a kind of distortion of what it means to be human. Because we are individuals at the lowest level, like you have individuation among rocks, trees, dogs, and cats, but they're not made in the image and likeness of God. Right. We are. And so when we speak about how three persons share one nature from eternity, but they're not three individuals, you know, suddenly it's no longer just abstract theology. This ends up basically showing us who we are and what we were made to be, and all only why salvation is more than a salvaging project. You know, if, if all God wanted to do was just to pardon criminals who were truly sorry, you know, well, that is, that is present in Islam. Allah will forgive you if you repent, but if he wants to divinize us, right. well then the incarnation becomes the most fitting way. But if he also wants to transform life, suffering, and death into the means by which life-giving love that originates within the communion of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, it's like, wait a second, press pause, we're going to need a divine plan for that because that kind of mystery is what Paul means when he says, eye has not heard, eye has not seen, ear has not heard. It's never entered into the mind or the heart of men what it is that God has in store for those who love him. And, and so what you're laying out in terms of this is so, it, it's so communicable. It's also irresistible. You know, chapter one, you set forth the framework of the covenant. Naturally, I love that. Surely. But in chapter two, you advance that. By moving from the notion of covenant, nuptiality, marriage, family, to the eternal covenant. Now, wait a minute. What is the eternal covenant? Isn't covenant is covenant is covenant? Because you're making a distinction here that I don't think most people recognize. That is, there is a covenant that is old, that is as old as creation, the human family, but there's an eternal covenant that opens up the way into the divine communion for which we were made. We're not just made in the image and likeness of God. You point out that we were made to share nothing less than communion with God. It's one thing to be like Him. It's another thing to be in Him forever and ever. So the eternal covenant, how does that work? Right, so, so here's an abstraction. We're created in the image of God. In our contemporary situation, I'm created in the image of a deity. This is abstract, right? Right. So the reality is we're created in the image of the Trinity because God is a Trinity. He's specific persons. So we're created in that image. And as Paul makes very clear to us in Ephesians chapter 5, we're created in the image of Christ in the church as a race, right? Adam and Eve... Um, that the passage, uh, man shall leave his mother and father and cling to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Paul says, um, but this refers to Christ in the church. Yeah, Aquinas raises the question at one point, um, since for him salvation has always been in reference to the coming of Christ, um, he asked the but it seemed like an abstract question to us. Prior to the fall, before God said, spoke about the conflict between the offspring of the woman and the offspring of the serpent, which is often called the Proto-Evangelion, the first yeah, announcement of the gospel. Right. Uh, I, and I would make a distinction. That's the first mention of the passion. Uh, but before that, before the fall, how then would they have known? And um, Aquinas says, they knew in their own existence. For they had been created in the image of Christ in the church. Um, what would have happened if people hadn't fallen into sin is, you know, maybe an interesting question of some sort. It's not, right. it's not my... It's a hypothetical, it's not counterfactual... My, right. That's right. Yeah, it's not my concern. But certainly Jesus wouldn't have had to suffer and die. But Jesus was still going to come. Because in creating us, and, and consider that the two accounts in Genesis both make it clear that that couple is at the center or pinnacle of creation. So everything, everything has been created in reference to that. 
means the whole act of creation was in reference to Christ and the church. So this is an eternal covenant because before the foundation of the world, that relationship of a redeemed humanity united to the Trinity in the person of Jesus of Nazareth, that's the plan. That's the plan when he says, let there be light right. until the end. It's one plan. And so um, the image, uh, so marriage is not a, a model among other models, it's not a model at all. It is the divinely created true image of the covenant. Right? God created a human race as a married couple, announcing even then, and in mystery, in a way that was, was hidden after the fall until it was revealed in the person of Christ, that this was the plan. And so all the covenants in the Old Testament, all the work of creation, everything centers on redeemed humanity united to Christ. Now, a, an important point here is that the church is the bride of Christ. Individualism leads us into a situation where people talk about individuals being the brides of Christ. Now, by application, we can say something like that. Yeah, you can have a meditation. Right. But the reality is he has one bride. He doesn't have thousands of brides. He got one bride, the church, of which we are members. And so there's a nuptial quality. But, but we're not individually married to Christ as, as such. He's not Solomon with 700 wives and 300 Correct. concubines. And yet, Correct. you know, when I was with the Mishawaka Franciscans recently, spending days with them, and a number of them were preparing for final vows, there really is a sense in which, just as marriage takes on deeper meaning by recognizing how Kimberly and I participate in this, this new covenant bond of interpersonal love, so likewise, as brides of Christ, they're not in competition with each other much less natural marriages. So on the one hand, I'm thinking of the original covenant being marital in the garden, in paradise. And yet on the other hand, the mystery of the eternal covenant points out how in heaven we're not gonna be married or given in marriage, not because marriage will be abolished, but because we'll enter into the marriage supper of the lamb, the marriage union, which will make the happiest marriages on earth almost seem like you know, misery compared to the glory, the intimacy, and the ecstasy that is this love for which we were made. Two other distinctions I kept thinking of as I was working through your book. <clears throat> On the one hand, what is first in the order of knowing, you know, when you are born, you get to know your parents, you get to know your siblings, and eventually you get to know yourself, but really you, you know yourself as soon as you're putting your thumb in your mouth. But in the order of being, God is first, even if you don't come to discover him until the age right. of reason. So in the order of knowing, salva <coughs> salvation is God's response to our fall, to sin. And of course, that's true. But on the other hand, in the order of being, it isn't just like, well, plan B, now that they fell. Right. It really is an eternal plan. And, you know, again, applying a little bit of Thomistic logic drawn from Aristotle, that what is last in execution is first in intention. And so if you're looking at a great architect designing a, a beautiful home, you don't, adjud you don't judge his work on the basis of how the rain brought the mud and so the pile of lumber and bricks is just a mess, you know, and the neighborhood is... No, you wait until he's done and then you see how well suited all of the intermediate stages were. And this is what you're opening our eyes to. That what is last anyway. in execution is this eternal plan right. that was really first in intention, but not first in execution, not even second, third, or fourth. And I think this way of thinking enables us to trust God as Father and to draw closer to Christ as bridegroom to a friendship that is more than transactional, more than contractual. You know, as you were saying a few minutes ago, we tend to prefer the relationships that we can kind of go in and out of like a store, you know, for whatever we come for, whatever we feel like we need. And so thanks for being a friend for my four years at college, a roommate or whatever, but I'm moving on. And then it's hard to render permanent anything like marriage and family are designed to be. And yet, once again, this isn't just the natural law. This is the law of Christ. This is the gospel that you're laying out for us. And by the time we get to the fourth chapter, chapter three deals with the fall, 
with Adam's sin and how it's more than just an act of disobedience. It really is, in a certain sense, a rejection of love. It's a breaking of a covenant, you know, and not just of a particular commandment. But by the time you get to chapter four, tell us, that strikes me as being sort of the heart of the book. Yes, chapter four does, uh, deals with Jesus, yes. right? Yes, kenosis, uh, his and, self and kenosis, right? So, yeah, that's, that's sort of, I, I call it the heart of the book. Everything moves toward it right. and flows from it. Yep. Um, because the kenosis, as the, which is the self-emptying, right? Jesus did not cling his um, identity as God, something in his, to be grasped, but rather emptied himself. Philippians 2, right. the Christ. Philippians 2. Right. But this is often, this passage is often under, understood as simply a Christology. And just the kind of sort of what we, in our Bible is kind of metered like a, like a hymn. But it's in a context, and the context is the attitude that must be ours. So it's actually discussing the Christian life. Have this mind among yourselves, which, which is, is the, the mind, mind of, of Christ. Christ, who, though he yes. was in the form of God, emptied himself, right? right? So kenosis, his <laughs> kenosis is his self-emptying. What does it mean to empty yourself? You can't empty yourself and like cease to be yourself, right? right? So. One way to say that is to pour yourself out. One way to say that is to love, right? And so Christ's um, kenosis is part of the humility of God from the very beginning by which <coughs> he created us. It, we think it's astonishing, when well, it is, as far as we're concerned, an astonishing thing that he created the universe. But there's no, he didn't break a sweat doing it, right? right. Uh, and then he holds it into being and he, he provides for us. This is all service. From the, from the very beginning, God is humbling himself to do this. Not for his sake. Right. He's not getting right. anything out of it right. that he had lacked before. Paul him. says, don't be looking out for, for you know, you know, glory, no, uh, vain activities, but attend to the needs of others, right? And God is attending to our needs. Jesus, out of love, empties himself in service to God and to humanity. Now. How can that be our attitude? Since we're not even in possession of ourselves. Right. how can we possibly empty ourselves out? Because Jesus has emptied himself by drawing us to himself, each one of us. He knew us and he loved us. In knowing us and loving us, he chose to offer himself for us and to unite us to himself. When we are united to Jesus, then his life becomes ours. Now, in Jesus, that's called kenosis. He's just emptying himself out. In us, it's called metanoia, which means conversion. Right. Because we have to turn. We have to turn back in order to be to pour ourselves out. We can neither turn nor empty ourselves out were it not for the fact that Jesus has made our life his and his life ours. And so the Christian life is metanoia. We have trouble with this in English because we translate that as conversion, penance, repentance. Conversion tends to suggest turning from God to belief. Penance tends to suggest um, contrition and maybe satisfaction. Repentance is uh, turning away from sin. But they're all translations of metanoia. And metanoia is this emptying ourselves out in Christ out of love for God and neighbor. And that is in everything we do. See, I think you've captured something here. That metanoia, I mean, literally, it's a change of mind. But it is changing the way you think about everything. And why? Because you've been given the mind of Christ. And not just more facts than you had before, but an entirely different way of relating to reality. You know, though he was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped or exploited, but he emptied himself, kenosis, you know, taking on the form of a, a servant, being obedient unto death, even death on the cross, and therefore God exalted him. Now, I think most people read that and tend to reduce it to this, that for 33 years, you know, Jesus basically held his divine breath and basically disguised himself as though he was merely human and not God. And so at the end, you know, God rewarded him. 
But in fact, I think what Paul's getting at is much deeper, that in a certain sense, there is a concealment of the divine glory, but there's also a revealing even more than there's a concealing, that when he is dying on the cross, unlike the two victims on either side of him, he wasn't losing his life. When he instituted the Eucharist, he already made his life a gift of love. And then the crucifixion is sort of proof that this was more than rhetoric or some ritual flourish added to the Passover. That was his body given up. This is the blood being poured out. He has transformed death, not only into an act of love, life-giving love, but far from eclipsing the Trinity, to the eyes of Saul the Pharisee, this is absurd, this is blasphemy. On the other hand, once he is blinded naturally and then enlightened supernaturally, he can see and then say in the Christ hymn that in effect what Jesus was doing with his humanity, not just even at death, but especially at death, was revealing the depth of the mystery of the inner life of God. And not just kind of catching it for a second, but downloading it into our humanity by uniting us to him through the Holy Spirit, through baptism, through the all, through the sacraments, as it were. And then suddenly, you know, you get a hangnail, you stub your toe, you know, pain, suffering. It's rather meaningless. But then united to Christ, it becomes meaningful, it becomes powerful. It doesn't add anything to what Christ suffered. No, Christ is adding everything to what we suffer so that suffering becomes really an expression of love. You know, pain becomes passion. Suffering becomes sacrifice. Death becomes life-giving love. And it's like, are brains exploding yet? You know, yeah, right. I mean, that's what right. happens when God the Father downloads the mind of Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. Our hearts are ignited, but our brains are illuminated by a mystery that in a certain sense blinds the mere reason of philosophers, but it raises little children to be made partakers of the divine nature. I mean, this is worth getting up early. This is worth staying up late. This is worth writing six chapters so that all of this life of ours, including the suffering, is preparation for what you describe in chapter six as the consummation of this marriage feast of the Lamb. Right, right. We don't, our suffering doesn't add anything to Christ because they're already his sufferings. Right. In, through the incarnation by which he took our nature, by his divine knowledge and love for us, now drawing his humanity up into that, he is, a parent doesn't feel well when a child is in pain. Our friends aren't, something's wrong with our friends, we're troubled by it. Well, with, we have all, with all of our sins, know how to have empathy and compassion for those we love. How much more does God have? Yes. And so part of Jesus' suffering on the cross was precisely not just our sins, but the evil that has befallen us in life, the evil that we've done in life, the suffering, physical, emotional suffering, all of that, because he's not a fair-weathered friend. To love in a fallen world means to have to encounter evil in your own life, in the life of those you, you love and care about, and therefore it means to suffer if you're going to remain connected to them. All Jesus had to do was let go of us, right. and all of that was gone. It was no problem to him, but he chose to love us, and this is the means of our redemption. He's not doing something by which God then rewards him by saving us. Our salvation is precisely constituted by the fact that he takes hold of us and unites us to himself. Although in doing so, he takes to himself joys and sorrows beyond our imagination. Um, the joy of offering us pardon of our sin, sharing of his life, giving us a part in his saving work for the salvation of the world, but at the same time, taking to himself the sufferings we endure, the sufferings we've caused others, knowingly and unknowingly, and our sins. And all this is constituted by the act of reconciliation, that is, of bringing us together with himself. That constitutes our salvation in Christ. And then our life becomes simply a living in, in Jesus. This is what metanoia is about. He describes it in Matthew chapter 6 in terms of prayer, um, self-sacrifice, and works of mercy. These aren't specific acts or things that we do. 
This is how we live our life. Right. And in them, Christ in us, in prayer, we can say to simplify things, in prayer, Christ in us turns our heart and mind to himself, to God. In self-sacrifice, Christ in us is actively turning us away in metanoia from our selfishness and sins. And in works of mercy, he's turning us toward others who are according to their need, right? And so then the whole Christian life simply becomes this living out of Christ's life, of his kenosis, through our metanoia of daily life. And that, as that happens, we are transformed. And then by our witness, by our intercession, others are transformed. And Jesus, working in us and with us, touches their lives. And so we have a role in salvation, which is absolutely astonishing. You know, I, I feel like you have uh, put your finger on the pulse of our Lord, Father Tim. You know, that you can almost get a sense of what is there in the heart of God. And the title captures it, As I Have Loved You. Because I think invariably we fall back into this mindset that God loves me because I'm good. And so when I cease to be good or I become right. less good, he loves me less and less. I mean, the tail doesn't wag the dog. And so our goodness is not what causes God to love us. God's love is, first of all, what brought us into existence, as you point out. But it also brings us to the point of repentance, but not just repentance. There really is a sense in which we enter into a communion with God that exceeds our wildest dreams. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and so uh, in effect, you start off by showing us that the goal is not just reconciling sinners, not just pardoning criminals, not just healing patients who are terminally ill, but nothing less than deification. Our filial divinization captured in theosis. Okay, that alone explains why the Father would send the Son to pour out the Spirit on the cross when he's not losing his life, he's giving up his breath, the water, the blood, baptismal, as well as Eucharistic. And then it's like, okay, how does theosis, how does it occur? Through kenosis. What's the purpose of kenosis? It is theosis. Right. And then you're looking at the cross and suddenly no longer is the love of the Father for the Son eclipsed like for a few hours. Ooh, he really got the dark side yes, of the force, yes, you know. Yes. No, yeah. you are seeing right. in his gift of life being poured out with the water, the blood, and the breath, a not, not a concealing of the Trinity, Correct. but to the eyes of faith, a revealing. This right. is not like divinity right. in disguise so much as this is the depth of divinity disclosed in the inner life of the Trinity right. is more than just a fact that we didn't know apart from grace. It is the reality of our life from now until eternity. Right. Right. And I, I don't know the history of like the Philippians hymn well enough to understand fully how people got into this notion that uh, the, the kenosis was that, that God hi Jesus hides his divinity. Um, or worse, that the words at the, on the cross, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me, is his existential experience of the darkness of contemporary man. Right. right? Because that, of course, is actually the beginning of a psalm a psalm of someone in great distress, but who in their great distress is absolutely, you can read the psalm, please do so, um, is absolutely certain that God is God, that he has a mission from God, and that this mission will lead to the glory of God and the salvation of humanity. Right? That's right. So David is writing Psalm 22, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because he felt forsaken. But it's also obviously a prophecy of a greater than David, but you don't write it in the midst of suffering, you write it after you've been delivered in thanksgiving to impart hope to other people who are also gonna face suffering. Gee, I wonder if Jesus knew that when he right. was quoting no, the first. Exactly. Exactly. He's evoking the whole message of the right. entire psalm. You know, and in the process, you also remind me that the Christ hymn began, it got hijacked uh, after the Protestant Reformation by some Lutherans who developed a canonic theology that, you know, in a certain sense, Jesus divests himself of his divinity and endures the wrath as Luther pictured it. And then I think we're coming full circle to recognize that's almost the opposite of what Paul actually intends and conveys in the Christ hymn there in, in Philippians 2, 6 through 11. You know, because what you end up seeing is that in resurrecting his son, in exalting Christ, 
so that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. It isn't like, okay, God simply vindicating his innocence. You guys condemned him, but he was actually righteous. Right. Yeah, no, yeah. It, it's not just resuscitating a corpse and then divinizing as a reward. I think what we see now is that God is vindicating Jesus' interpretation of what equality with God entails when you, uh, when you assume human nature and you live out divine life, divine love, divine life-giving love, you're going to live it out to the end and the cross is going to be the disclosure. And so the Father is saying, yes, my Son has basically exegeted what it means to be equal with God. And so I'm inviting all of you to enter into Him so that your smallest sufferings and the gravest illnesses unto death can be transformed even more than bread and wine is transformed in the Mass. Your suffering becomes a living sacrifice because you're sharing in Christ. And I tell you, this book has come at the right time because I think we're, gotten, we're getting to a point where the new evangelization is starting to kind of a downward slope where it's becoming jargon. It's uh, been co-opted. You know, it, it, it's, it's almost meaningless because what is it? Well, this is what it is. This is good news that, again, is almost too good to be true, except it's the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth of the Catholic faith distilled in the Paschal Mystery. And so I want to say thank you, not only for the privilege of publishing the book with Emmaus Road, but on behalf of all of your future readers, thank you for reinvigorating the gospel, for revitalizing how all of the sacred mysteries of our Catholic faith come together and really are present in the Mass, but then as we leave, as we're dismissed, we're going to go out and live that Mass by being living sacrifices. Amen. And it's like, yeah, well, amen. amen and amen. So again, I want to just encourage you not only to share this podcast with other people, but also to get hold of this new book, As I Have Loved You, which is Our Salvation in Christ, by Father Timothy Vaverick. Father Tim, thank you. Again, 10,000 thanks for joining me and all of us in doing the work of a priest, being an evangelist. Please, God. That's yeah. what I try to do. And may God bring all these good things to completion. Glory to God. And thanks again. Until next time, may the Lord richly bless you. Why don't you give us the blessing? Heavenly Father, we ask your blessings upon your people whom you have called to union with your Son, crucified and glorified now in heaven. Grant that we may empty ourselves out in and with Christ, that we may be your handiwork and your co-workers and come to share forever together the joy of the endless wedding feast in heaven. Through Christ our Lord, amen. May Almighty God bless you all, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. amen. Thank you, Father Tim. Take care. God bless.